weakly man defeats us with wisdom from above Breaking down the mystery into lessons of love Alright, praise the name of the Lord, friends and families of the world Thank you for joining us today with our land and media community And welcome to another episode of Weekly Manna Alright, let's go ahead and try to get started with a little prayer Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many mercies in our lives today. Lord, we come in your presence by the blood of Jesus, asking for mercy to be faithful, and we thank you for it. Uh, Father God, we ask you to open our eyes as we go on right now to the study of your word. Give us seeing eyes and give us hearing ears. Make our hearts to understand so that we may be blessed by it. And we pray this same blessing over everybody who's going to be coming in contact with this resource. Father, please be with them in the name of Yahushua. Amen. All right. So what are we going to be talking about today? Yes. So welcome, everyone. It's always good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. We are, um, if you've been following along, you know that we're in a, like a sub-series of a greater series. So we're in Tunic of Righteousness. This is part four. And it's part of a greater series that we're working on called the garments of righteousness. It's been really amazing. We thank God. This is the, the tunic, which is the white garment that covers the, the priest from the neck all the way down. And it's pure white. And today we're in part four of that series. Uh, Pastor Len, recently we've been talking about um, um, the concept of watching and milestones. And it's been really, really incredible. But I noticed with part four, it takes a slightly different turn. And I don't want to give it away. But could you kind of explain to us what, um, what, what the Sabbath is which is the part four of the tunic righteousness and how does it incorporate with the greater series hallelujah glory to god so tunic part four is going to be another wisdom strategy of the believer which the believer um, has to put on themselves so that um, they are not going to be found you know naked right. you know it's it's a wisdom strategy so tunic parts one to three talks about wisdom strategies that we glean from Yahushua himself. Okay. So looking at how Jesus operated when it was over here 2,000 years ago, we identified certain, certain strategies and certain tactics with the master that the master used to maintain a good, te a good testimony before the Father. But Tunic part four right now goes to the Father himself. Okay. So the Father as a person has certain strategies that he uses to stay airborne. <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable? It's really nice. I mean, and that's that strategy we call the Sabbath rest. And well, as we're going to be turning to lots of scriptures, you're going to see, especially from the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, predominantly maybe in the book of Hebrews, but starting from the book of Exodus, you're going to see God calls the Sabbath my Sabbath. Wow, that's right. That's right. Now, that's the Father talking to the people of Israel over there. It says, do not desecrate my Sabbath, my Sabbath, my Sabbath. Lots of times going to be telling them, tell them that because God rejuvenates himself. Okay. Uh, the Pharisees at one time were telling Jesus that, you know, God doesn't work anymore. Um, and then Jesus said, no, my Father still works. But the Pharisees said, well, God rested on the seventh day of creation and he's been resting ever since. But when you put those two scriptures together, God rested on the seventh day, correct? But Jesus says the Father still works. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It means that God goes on cyclical rests. So he's going to work day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. And on day seven, it's going to rest. And then that's going to be on day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. And on the seventh day, it's going to rest. Rest not necessarily sitting in front of the grandstands of the TV in heaven, just loafing around. No, no, no. Uh, rest in that context is talking about rejuvenating, recalibrating himself. And he encourages people, especially back in the Old Testament, that you got to learn from this. Right. You got to learn from this. So we are going to be delving deeper into that by the grace of God. And that's tuning part four, looking at the Father's strategy. Yeah, praise God. So, um, so. That's what we're going to be talking about today is Tilly Part 4 is Sabbath, uh, Sabbath Express. It's really exciting because, you know, how many people would like to have a day off, a legitimate day off, God-approved, okay? God-approved day off work. 
Uh, well, I raise my hand. I certainly would. Um, that is this day. That is this day. And it's not even necessarily a, a specific day. And Pastor Lynn, I, I know we have a lot to cover, but could you talk to us? Um, we've already kind of done an overview, but kind of zoom in on what is this Sabbath? Is it a specific day of the week? How do we how do we interpret this day so that we can honor God's word? Hallelujah. So back in the Bible days, the Sabbath uh, historically has been mapped to be what we call a Saturday right now. But a Saturday from the reference of what we know to be a Sunday. So what about if what we know to be a Sunday is actually originally a Wednesday. Who knows? So because the dating system we got right now, uh, you're gonna realize it's potentially, you know, being yeah. morphed yeah. And, and all of that. So we're not really sure when the actual first day of the week is in lots of cases. And potentially, you know, the first day of the week in one part of the world, maybe the second day of the week in yeah. a part of the world due to different time zone, time zones and all those kind of formats over there. But the most important thing, in my opinion, is to realize that when you've worked a maximum of six days, yeah. take the seventh day off and dedicate that time for spiritual activities to rejuvenate your spiritual systems. So we're going to start to read right now from Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. We're going to see how God commands the people of Israel to go on a cyclical Sabbath once every seven days. Exodus sixteen twenty three. Exodus sixteen twenty three reads, <clears throat> He said to them, This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake, and boil what you want to boil. Say whatever is left, and keep it until morning. Praise God. So even that was as far back as in the wilderness because mm -hmm. they hadn't gotten the promised land book of Exodus and yet God says keep my Sabbath mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you read the story in context for the sake of time we don't have the chance to go ahead and read the whole chapter of Exodus chapter 16 but essentially what God was telling them is you guys go ahead and work for food mm -hmm. for six days in a week you're going to work for food on the sixth day Make sure you collect twice as much food mm -hmm. because on the seventh day, you're not going to be working for food. Um, and on the seventh day, eat whatever you collected yesterday. And then on the seventh day, you want to dedicate that time to seek the Lord properly. So we can see right now that even on your Sabbath, the Sabbath started not necessarily as a time to fast food. Because based on the evidence of this scripture, we can see that people were allowed to eat on the Sabbath. Right. But by the time we got to the time of Jesus uh, and the Pharisees, the Pharisees had morphed this original instruction to interpret the Sabbath to mean that, well, on a Sabbath, you're not meant to work, you're not meant to fast, you're not meant to eat, you're meant to be fasting. And if they catch you coming to the sanctuary to get healed on the Sabbath, that's absolutely a blasphemy. Right. They are going to criticize you. We see that in the Gospels. And of course, Jesus didn't spare them, you know, he, he told them, no, that's not correct. You know, the original intent of the, of the Sabbath is to do good on the Sabbath. And then we can see that in the book of Exodus as well. So that's what the Sabbath is. It's not necessarily a time to stay away from food, but it's a time to stay away from working for food. Okay, if you're taking notes, you can write that down. Your Sabbath is a day in a week when you should stay away from working for food. Now, in our generation, we don't go outside our porch just to go collect manna, right. you know, back in the wilderness, and that's what they used to do. They would go outside their porches, outside their tents, collect manna, bring it over to their tents, and feed their families with it. Uh, so someone may say, well, that's not really applicable to us, but really in a sense, it does. It does apply to us because, you know, when you're working a job, you're actually working for food, right? So you can feed your family. So it's still gonna to apply to us. You may, you may be working as a banker, working as an engineer, uh, doing different kinds of works over there. You are trying to make money so you can have food for your family. You are working for food. Now God says, my expectation is a maximum of six days in a week. Do that. 
You want to do that five days? That's fine. You want to do that four days? That's all right. But maximum of six days. All right. And then the seventh day, shut it all down. Try to recalibrate your meters. Eat if you need to eat. But, you know, we recommend fasting food sometimes, especially if you do not have a health situation. You know, you know take a break from food a little bit so you can detox. Uh, we started seeing that tradition, especially in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 58. We're going to read that the first uh, five verses of Isaiah 58. By the time people got to the time of Isaiah in the Old Testament, people started incorporating fasting food into the Sabbath. Read from verse 1 to 5, and then from verse 13 to 14. Okay. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect to be heard, expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Verse 13. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Oh, yeah. So you see, verse 13 talks about Sabbath. From verse 1 actually to 12 talks about fasting. Okay. So you can see that uh, what God is, has, has at the back of his mind is, you know, keeping my Sabbath. This is my holy day. But then they've incorporated fasting into it. And God was not necessarily opposed to your fasting food. I mean, we're going to see situations in which Jesus fasted 40 days. Uh, Moses fasted 40 days on the mountain. Joshua down the mountain fasted 40 days. But the intent of the Sabbath is do not do as you please on my holy day. You want to make sure you do as I please on my holy day. Spend that time with me. Spend that time recalibrating your members. Spend that time renewing your relationship with me. Because all through the week, the working moment, you've depleted spiritual resources. Uh, potentially, you've been rubbing minds with the carnal and the unbelieving. We've pushed you down the negative milestones that we talked about two weeks ago, right? And you need to get on your Sabbath and start to do an evaluation of your spiritual meters. Am I down to a carnal will right now? Am I down to temptations right now? What can I do to make a U-turn? Those are the kind of questions that I've got to be asking myself on my Sabbath. Mm -hmm. But evidently, the people during the time of Isaiah weren't doing, doing that. Right. So all they did on their Sabbath was, you know, we're just going to humble ourselves and get, you know, get in sackcloths and we're just going to stay here, you know, and God says, well, but on that day, you're still fighting each other. Mm -hmm. On that day, you're still doing all kinds of detestable practices. You're staying away from food, but you're staying away from me. Oh. That's not what I want. I want you to stay away from food if you wanted to. Stay away from food, but come close to me. Oh. Spend that time with me. So that's what the Sabbath is. Uh, by the grace of God. Wow, yeah, praise God. That's good. You're staying away from food, but you're also staying away from me. That's, that's a, well, 
Yeah, so praise God. So that that is what the Sabbath is. Um, it's really good to have it sort of in a nutshell, the way Pastor Lynn describes it. But, you know, Pastor Lynn, I, I know you've already kind of talked about the why of the Sabbath, but if I can just kind of go back a little bit. If a person were to, on the other side of this um, uh, video, say, you know, I want to start honoring the Sabbath. This isn't something I've ever done before. I've heard people talk about it from time to time. And every now and then I read the Bible, I can see God's really uh, determined that his people follow the Sabbath. Um, what, what would that what would that look like? What, what would I do? I, I know he says it's not all about food or not eating food, but what would that look like in my situation? Could you kind of walk us through what would uh, a, a simple day of a Sabbath day look like? That's correct. Great question. So um, if you don't have a medical condition, you know, I recommend skipping at least two meals. Okay. You know, skip your breakfast, skip your lunch, drink water, drink juice. You know, we recommend drinking water here in this ministry so you can flush the toxins away from your body. You know, the body has the potential of producing toxins, converting fat into energy and all those kind of things we learned in high school. But, you know, um, so you can be able to, you know, get energy to pray, you know, drink some juice, apple juice or whatever, whatever your body's comfortable with, drink some water and skip eating. Okay. Just skip it a little bit. And then while you're doing that, you're not potentially going to be spending time in your kitchen because you don't think you want to eat anyway. Mm -hmm. So repurpose that time to, to get into the Word. Oh, repurpose that goodness. time to get into prayer. You know, in this ministry, we, don't, we pray the kingdom through every day. You know, repurpose that time to pray sanctification prayers. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things we do in this ministry. And spend time in prayer. So if I normally spend about three hours cooking a meal, the expectation is on my Sabbath, now I'm going to repurpose those three hours in prayer and in the Word. Okay. How do I do that in the Word? Well, we've got resources on YouTube. That's we have resources in the study notes. We've got resources on MP3s. If you connect with us, we're going to give you those resources. So those three hours, you know, play a full-length ODP message. Okay. Uh, especially the pharmacy section of the ODP message which is designed to repair any dysfunctions of the human heart. You know, we have that food timetable yes. in this ministry that's gonna remind you to do that. Listen to at least two ODP messages to recalibrate your meters. Then get your tunic of righteousness studies. It's gonna be very important. So at this stage of your study, if you've been coming with us from January, the most important part of the ODP for you right now is the tunic of righteousness. Now for the person who's just joining us, the most important study for them is gonna be the pharmacist section of the word. But if you've been with us since January and you are right now in week number 40, get your tunic studies and start to look at those wisdom strategies to be like a wise virgin again. And start to ask yourself, am I a wise virgin? Or am I a foolish virgin? Do I have oil in my jar? Am I watching and praying? And let those things just bring refreshment, rejuvenation to you. So um, if you have a medical condition, you're welcome to eat a little bit, but you can even scale down on eating. You can eat maybe just lightly, right? Uh, if you have babies that you need to feed, of course you gotta feed them. But while you're feeding them, you know, get your messages plain in your pocket and put the MP3s over there. Work with the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit work with you to give time to the Lord on your Sabbath. You know, your schedule may be different a little bit, but do something like that. Now, granted, you know, lots of us spend a lot of time in, in church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I can hear some people say, well, I go to church on Sunday and I spend about four hours in church. Shouldn't that count as my Sabbath as well? Well, he does. He does count as your Sabbath. So if you want to reserve Sunday, exclusively as your Sabbath, that's fine. Yeah. When you come back from church, you can still study the Word and make sure you do it extensively. Well, if you cannot reserve the whole of Sunday for your Sabbath, take a little portion from your Saturday, merge it together with your Sunday service so you can have a full 24 hour period where you are recalibrating yourself. Yeah. Oh, but I go to work on Saturday and I can't help myself. Okay, well, if you go to work on Saturday, <laughs> Then Sunday, make sure you don't go to work. <laughs> because the Father says uh, a maximum of six days work, right? So you want to go, go to work on Saturday, that's fine. But on Sunday, you know, shut it down, recalibrate yourself. 
But we live in a generation where people, lots of people don't go to work on Saturday. So they have that luxury to take a significant portion of their Saturday, merge it together with their Sunday, and then they can have a 24 hour period of no distractions mm -hmm. from the carnal and beyond believing. I can focus on God exclusively and do the Father's Sabbath. Oh yeah, praise God. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, yeah, so that, that's exactly what uh, what we have been learning all of this last Sunday. By the way, this is just going to be a summary form of what we learned this last Sunday. If you want the full length message, you'll want to go and listen to a lot of really great gems come out of that message. Um, but you know, Pastor Land, uh, you know, I'm reminded of the scripture that says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Right. I'm sharing that because, you know, some people on the Sabbath day, um, they're looking for ways to just get closer to God. Are you saying like ultimately God is just wanting you to honor him? Take a day off and get rejuvenated. And I know we're going to go into the why in a moment. Get rejuvenated. Get your spirit, like you said, retuned so that you you don't fall when tempted. I mean, that's right. is that kind mm -hmm. of the, speaking of the, the why, could you give us um, maybe two, three or four strong reasons why this is important to God and why it should be? Just as important to us. Yeah, we got a number of reasons right here on page number 112 of your study notes. If you get your study, you have your study notes in front of you, you're welcome to pull it out, but you're going to see a lot of reasons here. But I'm going to talk about the most important reason. Okay. The most important reason is going to be stated in Hebrews chapter 4, okay. um, in verse 9 to 11, talking about how to answer rest the way the Father answered rest. You know, you can use the Sabbath to rejuvenate your members. And act, actually, all these reasons, if you're doing Sabbath cyclically all through your life, should culminate in what the Bible is going to be talking about in Hebrews chapter 4, mm -hmm. from verse 9 to verse 11. Let's go ahead and read. Okay, Hebrews 4 verse 9 reads, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Praise the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Please underline that. You've got a paper copy of the Bible. God says, for you watching me right now in the New Testament, there is a Sabbath rest for you. Now, what's that Sabbath rest? How do we get there? Keep reading. For anyone who enters God's rest mm -hmm. also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Mm -hmm. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. So he says, um, there remains... A Sabbath rest for the people of God. And everybody who enters God's Sabbath rest will rest from his labor, labors, just like the Father rested from his labors. Let us therefore labor or make every effort to enter that rest. So comical that people say there's no labor in the New Testament anymore. God says make every effort <laughs> to enter rest the way God entered rest. God answered rest? Mm -hmm. Correct. What's the meaning of that? Well, you're going to go back to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, you're going to see that God created certain things on day number 1, day number 2, day number 3, day number 4, day number 5, day number 6, and then day number 7, the Father rested mm -hmm. from all of his works. Well, that's suggestive of the fact that, well, God was not at rest on day number 1. Right. God was not at rest on day number 2. God was not at rest on day number three, day number four, day number five, day number six, and on day number seven, he entered into rest. Now, the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter four says that the people of the Old Testament, they enter the promised land, but then there is still a Sabbath rest for them, mm -hmm. even though they were in the promised land. I want to challenge you to go ahead and read Hebrews chapter four. That was Paul's argument to, to his Hebrew brothers when he was telling them that there is no point talking about another Sabbath rest if Joshua had given them rest by taking them to the promised land. But then the Bible still says, says after Joshua had taken them to the promised land, there is still remains rest. What's the meaning of that? So it means that even though in the physical promised land that they were, they were still not at rest. Wow. <laughs> so there is a spiritual place of rest. This Sabbath rest we're talking about over here, it's a spiritual place of rest, which can be patterned to the way the Father answered rest after the recreation in the book of Genesis. Wow. And the reason we're calling it recreation is we understand that 
you know, especially if you're coming through the pharmacy section of the word, Lucifer fell between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2. And a lot of our brothers are going to debate against that, but it makes logical sense because the word of God says that Lucifer was in Eden. He rebelled against God and God cast him to the earth. And then God created man and placed him in the Garden of Eden. And then that lets us know that, well, God made man to replace Lucifer. He just replaced Lucifer. And then when Lucifer started talking to Eve in the Garden of Eden incident, he was already talking like somebody who'd fallen already. So we know the fall of Lucifer predates the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And by extension, the creation of Lucifer and all his demons and all his mm -hmm. angels yeah. definitely predated the account talked about in Genesis chapter 1 from verse 2 downwards. Mm -hmm. Well, how come God didn't go into the details of, mm -hmm. you know, how he created Lucifer? And Well, that's not important to him. And if it's not important to him, it's not important to you on this side of eternity as well. But the only thing we got to believe right now is that the father was not at rest. As a consequence of Lucifer's rebellion. Mm -hmm. That's right. And he had to do certain things on purpose. On day number one, he said, let there be light. And there was light. And then day number two, he said, let there be a firmament to separate the waters from the waters. Then he did certain things on day number three and day number four, day number four. And all those things have spiritual implications, which are documented for you in your study notes, if you want to know the truth about it, on how you are going to enter into rest. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of it. You want to get the details, go get your study notes. But I'm going to whet your appetite right now. Let's look at the logic of day number six. The logic of day number six, what God had to do was to create man, Adam and Eve. And he placed them in the Garden of Eden. That's right. And then the next thing we know is day number seven, God rested. Yeah. Why did God create Adam and Eve on day number six? Why didn't God create Adam and Eve on day number four? And why did God even place Adam and Eve in Eden, which is close to the throne of God? You're going to read the book of Isaiah. The Eden is close to the throne of God. Uh, you're going to read the book of Ezekiel. Eden is close to the throne of God. God created people to surround him that are not going to be in rebellion anymore. Because if he surrounds himself with Lucifer, who is rebellious is going to go back into unrest. Oh. So what's the practical implication of that in your story? Well, the practical implication of that in your story, the spiritual implication of day number one up until day number six, is you got to have in mind in your future, you got to have in your future that shortly before I enter this kind of Sabbath rest over here, I've got to surround myself with Adams, mm -hmm. with Eves, mm -hmm. no longer with Lucifer's, or else you will never enter mm -hmm. this, the Father's Sabbath rest. Mm -hmm. What are certain things that will help you to surround yourself with Adam and Eve um, in the Garden of Eden, in your Garden of Eden? Well, day number one, let there be light in your mind to start with. Yes, praise God. God's going to give you illumination. What do I need to do around my schedule around my vocation to move me in the direction of surrounding myself with Adams and Eves in my future. Mm -hmm. And day number two is going to restore order to your heavenlies. Well, that means that you're going to start retrieving. Retrieving traded authorities, making sure that there's no blocked heavenlies over your head through actions of obedience and separating waters from the waters. But we'll talk about all those details over there, but I want to let you know that there's a deep study here in yeah. Hebrews chapter 4 from verse 9 to verse 11. There is a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And the way you're going to get there is to cyclically go every week on, on a Sabbath. Go on a Sabbath, rejuvenating your meters, get to know God better, and then God's going to start to show you how to enter rest. So, Brother Land, what's the meaning of that Sabbath rest? I don't understand. What's the meaning of the spiritual place of rest when the spiritual place of rest is a place where you don't have Lucifer close to you anymore? Mm -hmm. That's good. There is no oppression in your mind. You have what we call right now an ODR, which is like an open door resource. 
You have people around you that are not rebelling against God's purposes for their lives. You don't have chaos in your world. There's no affliction in your world. You are totally at peace with creation. Oh, totally at peace. And creation is at peace with you. Wow. Now, a lot of us, you know, God is helping us, but there is some kind of chaos in our lives. And we don't have the open door resource, which some of our brethren call the glory. We don't have all that's going on right now, so we are definitely not at rest. But you got to put your eyes on the promised land. It's a spiritual promised land, just like the people of Israel put their eyes on a physical promised land. The New Testament believer is uh, instructed to put his or her eyes on the spiritual promised land of the Sabbath rest. Now, this is the meat of the word. This is the meat of the um, word. I didn't have all the time to delve deeper into it because we got to close right quickly. But the details are going to be here uh, for some of our brethren who are interested in that. You can see here, discipleship study notes for rapture eligible believers. It's going to be on page number 113-114 of your study notes. Wow, well, yeah, praise God. This is a deep study. I was really good. And if God gives you eyes to understand and see and really the the light to walk in it you will walk in god's rest you know okay so i know you're ready to close <laughs> but i'm just wondering you know uh final question um and actually before i ask this question when when pastor lamb was talking about surrounding yourself with people who are not in rebellion against god what the implication of that is for you and, and me and uh, everyday people is one such implication is you know, God setting you free from what we call like the Babylonian system. And that's the reason we won't go into it too much. There's a full length message, but that is a really big promise. And not only that, it has really great, tremendous ripple implications for your life and for your children's lives. Whenever God says, hey, I want you to leave a legacy of godliness and working at, you know, ABC grocery store won't do it, you know, or working here or going there. He's going to, his, his goal for you, his vision for you and for all of his children is to literally be taken out of that system and living a life that's free. Like, it's like, I'm finally free. Free to do what? Free to worship God and live in that bubble of the of KOG. Um, but Pastor Land, just one final question and I'll shut up. Um, Jesus, mm -hmm. was when he was here walking on the earth, was he in God's rest? Absolutely. Like that rest? Absolutely. Yeah. That's why the reason he surrounded himself with the 12. Wow. So Yahushua entered day number six when he started ministry and he called 12 people around himself. Wow, that's good. That was his day number six. And subsequently he had rest. He didn't have his siblings who were always taunting him at home anymore. You know, he didn't have all that. He had all that going on in day number five okay. before he stepped into ministry and then he surrounded himself with 12 guys. Those were the guys that he spent his waking moments with. Those guys may be poor, broke fishermen, but at least they're going to listen to the word. Yeah. <laughs> at least they're going to go to Jesus to go pray in the garden of Gethsemane. You know, that is a place of rest. Oh, does it mean that I got to enter into ministry if I want to get into the kind of spiritual rest you're talking about? Well, not necessarily. When people got to the promised land back in the Old Testament, they still worked jobs. Yeah, yeah. They worked on farms. Okay. You know, they had vineyards and all yeah. of that. But they weren't working around Nebuchadnezzar's anymore. Right, that's good. That's so that, good. that's the whole idea. So right now, from day number one to day number five, you're working with Nebuchadnezzar's. Mm -hmm. Who wants your mind to go into Babylon? That's good. Babylon. Babylon is a spiritual city where people trade their souls for money. Okay. So good. Now, and the Nebuchadnezzar's that we're working with this generation, they are under the, the wine of Babylon. Now, we talked about that extensively in time snapshot I can get into. Um, God wants you, just like Daniel wasn't comfortable working with Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. even though he had to do that for 70 years in his case, but he was not comfortable with that. Yeah. He was always at the back of his mind, Father. How can I sing the song of the yeah. Lord in a strange land? Even though he was serving Nebuchadnezzar, he was not comfortable there. Yeah. So the same the same attitude with you. You shouldn't be comfortable working with Nebuchadnezzar's 
who are keeping you in a status of spiritual unrest. Because mm -hmm. what's going to happen is because of their sins and iniquity, you're working with them. They're going to cause fires on that job. Mm -hmm. Because of them, the server's not going to work well. And you're going to have to pray probably for the server to work well. If you're working as a banker, because of them, the, <laughs> the, you know, the account <laughs> is not going to balance. Something's going to, and they don't understand <laughs> that it's because of their afflictions. And you're going to have to come and pray and all of that. They don't know that. And when you fix the problem, they take credit for it. And then they go back and repeat the same old dumb stuff again and put you back in unrest again. And they don't know what they're doing. Now, if you live in that circuit, you're going to be wasting resources. Yeah. Your anointing wouldn't grow. Now, what you want to do, should I quit my job right now? No. Mm -hmm. You got to do it like Daniel. Like Daniel was praying, God, give me an exit out of Babylon. Give me an exit out of the control and shackles of Nebuchadnezzar, essentially. And while you're there, make sure you don't go to Babylon. What do you mean? Yes, you can work for Nebuchadnezzar and not go to Babylon. Because yeah. Babylon is a scripture state of mind. Mm -hmm. You are going to be working with Nebuchadnezzar, but you're going to be leaving in the city of the name of the Lord, mm -hmm. which is a strong tower. You're going to be deploying potties and dealings over there. Making sure that your mind is not traded for money. Mm -hmm. Just like we talked about end time snapshot, the word of God says that Babylon has the souls and the blood of people inside her. And then the merchants of the earth are exchanging these souls for merchandise. Mm -hmm. So there are some people in the earth. The word of God calls them in Revelation chapter 18, chapter 17, as the merchants of the earth. They trade people's souls. Gonna, they're going to take people's minds, wills, emotions, send them over to a spiritual system called Babylon, and then they're going to give people money as a consequence of that. And because of that, the Word of God says that the blood of the saints of God are, fi are found in that system. The souls of men are found in that system. And most shockingly, the blood of everybody who's been killed on the earth is found in that system. So that's how we know this goes beyond a geographical location. Now, I don't want to talk about end time snapshot part five over here, but if you want to listen to it, go back to uh, the YouTube channel. End time snapshot part five. That's the reason we are talking about Sabbath rest over there. You shouldn't see that in your future. Yeah, yeah. In your future, you should see yourself not surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar's, we want to give your mind and your will and your emotions to the spirit of Babylon who is really interested in your blood mm -hmm. or interested in the blood of your children or your family, your wife, your spouse. Your... No, no, no. In your future, you see yourself working in Zion. That's good. Wow. Oh, what does that mean for me? How do I? Well, that's the number one question. How God's gonna is gonna is gonna slowly guide you and navigate you to give you a place, a business, or whatever. Navigate you to creating your future. This is like the ideal future I want for myself right now. That's a day number one question. Because in day number one, what needs to happen is let there be light. Mm, illumination. Illumination in my mind concerning what to do to steer in the direction of day number seven. Now, if you don't have that light just yet, that's fine. Mm -hmm. It means you're in day number zero. <laughs> What's the meaning of day number zero? Well, the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the surface of the waters, and then God said, let there be light. When the Spirit of the Lord is hovering, there's no light just yet. Well, keep, keep hovering right. with the Spirit of the Lord. What does that mean? It means you're praying. That's you're right. generating the spiritual energy, just like Daniel did back in the Old Testament. He kept on praying, God, give me understanding. I don't want to die in Babylon. I have my eyes on Jerusalem. Keep on praying. And all of a sudden, there's going to be some idea that's going to click in your mind. And that's going to be day number one. Now, granted, that idea is not going to break a harvest until day number five. Okay. So you got to work that idea on day number one, day number two, day number three, day number four. You don't see anything. You are still surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar's. But keep on working. Your day number five is coming. Your day number six is coming, and then day number seven, you enter into your Sabbath rest, and you are rapture eligible. Ooh. Ooh. If I'm not in day number seven, I can't be raptured. I'm sorry. No, no. 
you're not gonna go. <laughs> oh, why are you talk like that? But we're out of time. Oh, we're out of time. We're out of time. This is just getting good, and you know it's a trip. Well, I'm fascinated. This really has been a blessing. I I always love tunica uh, tunica righteousness, but you know, part four is really powerful because um, it gives us first of all, it gives us hope. You know, for people who don't, <clears throat> there are plenty of believers, I believe, who want to be free from Babel, from the Babylonian system. And this whole message, Tunica of Righteousness Part 4, is all, it's all about uh, Sabbath rest, God, the God kind of rest. And God wants that for me. He wants that for you. He wants that for all of his children. And just as we just heard, there is no uh, uh, getting out of here, rapture eligibility without it. So we really want to strive for it. So I, I really uh, ask everyone and beseech you to please go and watch the full length message if you had a chance to. I'll actually um, link it here in this video as well. And you might even see it pop up in a few minutes at the end of the video. Watch the full length message to be blessed. And just know that God has a vision for you that's much bigger than you currently see it. And I thank God that Pastor Lenny walked us through it. Um, any final thoughts? Okay. Yeah, so um, in addition to listening to the full length 90 minute message of Tunic Part 4, I want to recommend for anybody who's going to be really interested in So you guys are talking in terms of really deep stuff I've never heard of, heard of before. And Time Snapshot Part 5. Oh, that's right. It's going to be a complimentary study to get, in fact, a whole end time snapshot series. So if you haven't heard that before, it's going to be on our YouTube channel. It's going to let you know the reason this is important. Yep. Because this is like, you know, being a wise virgin mm -hmm. was going to be ready for the marriage yeah, supper. Right. So it's tied together with end time snapshot, actually. So all those things we're talking about over here. They're going to be tied again. We're getting you ready and rapture eligible. So both messages, actually both series of messages, the tunic series, the end time series, they, they go hand in hand and the resources are available for you on our YouTube channel. Would you do that for me? I want to believe. I'm sure you. I want to believe and I'm sure. I want to believe. <laughs> believe I'm sure. <laughs> You're going to do it. All right. Discipleship study notes from Pure Smarts uh, Ministries. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for an awesome opportunity. Yes, Lord. Right now in your word, oh God. Yes, Lord. You've opened our eyes to understand, most importantly, the Sabbath rest. Yes. The spiritual promised land of the New Testament believer, my Father, I'm asking you, God, give us practical understanding. Break these nuggets down for us and help us to be doers of it yes. on a weekly basis. And as we do that on a weekly basis, to understand how to steer in the direction of the promised land that you have for us. Mm -hmm. I receive this blessing. These blessings for everybody who's going to be coming in contact with this resource, for myself, for my wife, for everybody else, who's going to be coming in contact with this resource in the name of Yahushua. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you for staying on board. We are landing me over to from Pure Smarts Ministries. Until next time, remember God cares about you and so do you. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Weekly manna feeds us with wisdom from above. Breaking down the mystery into lessons of love.